right, girls, Pastor Jess here. We are going to be showing you a portion of our women's conference. I pray that you're blessed by it. I hope you learn. These are some hot topics and some things. I pray you learn and you're educated and that you see God's hand in it and that it blesses your heart. Love you. gives us the Old Testament, which is written for our example, so that we can learn from them. So what I've done is we've asked each one of our panelists to pick out a woman from the Old Testament who knew and understood her identity and able, was just able to stand in her cultural moment and maybe against the tide of what was happening so that she could be an example for us. So we've got some wonderful biblical examples and we're gonna pull out some of the truths that we can use to see how this identity manifests itself, how it's practical. So Pastor Sue, will you start us off? Okay. Um, well, I chose Esther, of course, the one that there's the most stuff written about, but um, there's a whole book written about Esther and you need to read it. It is actually, it's just such an amazing story how God worked and you see the hand of God in every little detail. But the thing that was so amazing about Esther is it's, it's uh, most people believe she was about 14 when she was taken into the, you know, the, the, the king's harem or whatever to be prepped, a year preparation to be queen. And she became queen, which is amazing. There's so much to the story that's wonderful. But basically, um, the problem that she was sent to solve <laughs> is that God knew there would be an evil man alongside the king. And God knew that her people who had been scattered all throughout the Persian Empire would need saved. So God strategically had her right there, the right place at the right time to intercede for her nation. And um, so with the wisdom of God, she'd been married about seven years, so she was like 21. She um, was told, you know, God strategically placed you here to go to the king on behalf of your people because they're about to be slaughtered. And so um, she, she um, you know, had a moment of, I don't think I can do this because if you come before the king and he hasn't summoned you, you will be killed. But her uncle, or actually some believe it was her uncle or her older cousin, really, I think the word indicates, said in Esther 4.14, for if you remain completely silent at this time, relief and de deliverance will arise from the Jews from another place, but you and your father's house will perish. So you're still going to die. Yet who knows whether you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. We quote that a lot. But we have been called to this time for such a time as this, not to be silent, but to rise up with the wisdom and the voice of God. So she did not remain quiet, but what's amazing about her is in her humility and in her fear of the Lord, she knew what she was going to do. She was going to go through a, to a king that the queen before him, he had cast her out of his presence, never to be seen again. And so she was dealing with uh, definitely some male ego. Anyway. She, um, she knew what she was up against, and she said to her, her cousin, her older cousin, have everyone fast and pray. I'm going to fast and pray with my maids, my handmaidens. She had the humility and the wisdom to know that it was the time that we needed fasting, we needed prayer. In the fear of the Lord, she knew it was going to take God to help her win the favor of the king and to turn the course of her whole nation. So we need to be that wise and have the fear of the Lord and turn in this hour to much fasting and prayer for what's going on in our generation. And then she was brave. She went to the king. She, he put out his scepter so she was not killed for coming into his presence. And then she was very courageous. Courageous. She had she, all she asked for was a banquet. He came to the banquet. Then she asked for another banquet. And she asked for this evil man that was right next to the king to come also. So one thing there, too, she was brilliant. 
She knew that by placing a little intrigue there and making it a very important question, you know that question that some of your husbands asked you for you to marry him? You know, it was a setup. I mean, you had the photographer there and it, it was an important question. She knew that it was very important what she had to do. And so she made him hungry a little bit for what is it you want? What is it you want? And it was a serious matter. And that was, so it was such a setup there. She was so wise. And then when she told him what was going on, then, uh, then immediately he had that person, you know, uh, killed. And the gallows that he had really erected for her, uh, her cousin, he, he actually got hung on those gallows. But the outcome of it, the result of it, is that her whole nation was saved by her courage, by her brilliance, by her fear of the Lord. Her whole nation was saved. And then the end result, this is so powerful. It says in Esther 8, 17, And in every province and city, wherever the king's command and decree came, the Jews had joy and gladness, a feast and a holiday. They were allowed to actually turn and kill their enemies. And so by having this decree set forth that, that, that all the Jewish people were going to be killed months ahead, all the enemies came out of the woodwork, like, we're going to get you. So then the king made another decree, which was Esther's request. He made another decree that her people could defend themselves, and he actually gave them another day. So for two days, they slaughtered over 700,000 of their enemies. So they basically were ushered into a kingdom without any enemies around them. There was a day of triumph and victory over all the land, and God's people were elevated to a place of strength. And it says, Then many of the people of the land became Jews because fear of the Jews fell upon them. So God had the last say, and he used a little girl that was a Jew. The problem of a whole nation that was going to be slaughtered. A woman in the right place, to whom a God had called her to, willing to stand in the gap, to call those under her influence to prayer, to be in that place and to step forth courageously, literally changed history. And that, that moment, that celebration is still celebrated by the Jews, by the people of Israel. To this day, that's how important this moment was. And God used one of his girls to do that. Incredible. Dr. Vanessa, you got an Old Testament woman you'd like to share? So I chose Jochebed. How many people know who she is? Not many, because her name's not said a lot, but she was a mother, the mother of Moses. Have you heard of him? She was a great woman of God, and um, I chose her because a lot of times in our society, we like to categorize people, and mothers feel less than when they don't work outside the home not thinking about how much work you do inside the home and how valuable you are and how much your worth is. But this great mother, she was a woman of God. You know, in Exodus 2.2, it says she became pregnant and gave birth to a son. And she saw that he was a special baby. And she kept him hidden for three months because the Pharaoh had made an edict that all the babies, all the boy babies, the midwives were to kill them, that they were to be killed. And so this woman had to be politically aware. Yep. A lot of times we don't, uh, some women don't like to deal with politics. You know, I'm just gonna pray, I'm gonna stick my head in the sand and ignore it. If she had ignored it, they would have just come in there and killed her baby, right? And then she stood strong, you know, where the I stand women, she stood strong against this edict. She risked her life and she hid her baby for three months. Now you know when they're one or two months old, they can keep quiet, but three months old is starting to babble and be loud. She's trying to hide him and save his life, and he's just talking and doing all kinds of stuff. You can imagine, right? And then she was a wise woman because she, you know, when we are in a situation where there appears to be no way out, God comes through. He gave her an innovative idea. Put the baby in this basket. He's so adorable. When Pharaoh's um, daughter, sees him, she won't be able to resist. He will not be killed. But she knew to make the basket out of papyrus. Now that was known in those times to be a, a crocodile repellent. Then she lined the inside of the basket with tar so it could be waterproof. And then her and her daughter Miriam waited 
until Pharaoh's daughter came out. And then they pushed the basket toward her. And sure enough, just as God had gave her peace in her heart, having faith when you don't understand how the outcome is going to be, she saw the baby and she loved him. And Miriam, who was Moses' sister, says to Pharaoh's daughter, do you want me to find one of the Hebrew midwives to nurse this baby? And she said, yes, please do. And she went and she got her mother, Jochebed, his mother, Jochebed. So she got, even though in her mind she might have thought she was giving up her son, she got him back in obedience to God. Amen? And a lot of times we just have to trust God. At that time, she did not know that he was going to be the, the deliverer. She did not know that he was going to cross the Red Sea, that he was going to be the lawgiver, that he was going to be able to go and talk to God and get the Ten Commandments. She didn't know any of that. But she knew God. He spoke to her and told her this was a special child. She knew God. He gave her an idea how to save this baby's life. And she knew God. And she did not back down. She stood firm. And when we're in a hopeless situation, we just got to trust God. When we know the outcome, there's no faith there, right? We got to trust him and know our identity. Even as mothers, not working outside the home, you are special. God will speak to you. Even when there seems to be no way out, he'll give you that way out. We can't hide our heads in the sand. We have to be politically aware. We, we are intelligent enough to do this thing, and God will be there for us every step of the way. Amen? Wow. As a mother, you have no idea what God has called your kid to, right? Your child to. We just heard in the last session about generations, right? And as we walk with him, God is able to do what he wants to do in those next generations. I was thinking about the law that you talked about, right? It was against the law for her to do all of this, to keep her baby alive, to feed him, to try to rescue him, to make this, you know, and the New Testament tells us that all things are lawful, but not all things are helpful. And we're going into a, a season, a time, an age here in California and in our nation where more and more things become lawful, but that doesn't mean they're right. It doesn't mean they're good. And we have to be able to tell the difference. Here was a law that she didn't obey because she knew God. She knew what God said about life. She knew that murder wasn't right. And we have to know the difference. We have to know that unchanging word of God. So we know when we need to stand and when we need to follow, right? We need to be able to draw a line in the sand. That's what she was doing. She was saying, as for me and my house, we're not going to obey that law because that's not godly. How important it is and what God can do with women who stand up in the right season when they've called him. Pastor Michelle, will you share? So I chose Deborah. Deborah to me was one of the most influential women of the Bible, definitely countercultural. She was a judge in a very male dominated uh, society and she was also a prophet. She was known for her wisdom, her faith, her courage and her actions. And she was a leader and also a warrior, and she chose to lead in battle as a woman and, and to fight against the oppressor of Israel at that time. And she didn't do it alone, but I would imagine that she was the only female on the battlefield. And she was just being obedient to what Christ had called her to do, which was not a small feat. I mean, being a female and going to battle she didn't fight with a sword and a shield, but she fought in the spiritual. She went to war in the spiritual. She heard God's voice and she led people. And I'm sure she had, the, she must have had this like God confidence because I can't imagine what that would have felt like. Uh, but, and I'm sure she had a lot of people who were telling her she couldn't, wouldn't, and shouldn't, but she did. And because of her obedience and because of her faith and her trust in Christ, she was able to pave the way. And that to me is just such a testament to how, you know, just how we are to live our lives and just faith and surrender and trusting God in every step that we take and that he's going to protect us and that he's going to guide us and that we are going to have the victory. And I know that God is calling us to some great things. And he's calling us to, th to things that maybe in the natural, we look at it and we say, I don't think I could do that. But with God, we can. 
And so God takes that natural and he applies the supernatural and then here we are. So I just, I really love that story because, you know, a lot of us in the workplace or wherever you are, you know, you're, you know, you're in positions of that maybe, you know, you're judges or maybe, you know, you're in a male uh, dominated, you know, whatever position, I mean, or society or field and you're called to lead. And I just want to encourage you guys. You guys are there for a reason. You're there because God chose you to be there. So I think as saints and what we've been learning, it's our time to rise up. It's our time to represent. So I just want to encourage you with that today. Wow, that's wonderful. That's wonderful. You know, Deborah had a word, right? She had a word for the captain of the Lord's armies. And he said, I'm only going to go if you go with me. Mm -hmm. So she brought the word and then she went and she followed it through, right? Mm -hmm. The problem was they needed a word from God and she was in her place and she was able to give that word. And then she was able to be the helper to go alongside so they could go to battle and they could see victory. Just incredible women and incredible examples of us of a strength, the easer, the strong help. Mm -hmm. Such a beautiful picture. Pastor Tracy, will you share? Yeah, in the Old Testament, there was a beautiful woman named Tamar and she's one of the few in the lineage of Jesus and her claim to fame is that she dressed up like a prostitute and got pregnant. Yeah. Isn't that crazy? But she was called righteous. Yeah. So there's something to be said. And the background, when, when you hear the story, it'll be a little clearer. Judah was the father of the tribe of Judah. And there was a prophecy over his life that he would be in the lineage of the Messiah, the great king. The problem is he had married a Canaanite woman. And he had wicked kids. And so... Talking about problem solving, and I don't know if she knew it from the outset, but uh, he got a wife for his oldest son. It was Tamar. The Bible says he was wicked and God killed him. Well, the next son, also wicked, God kills him. There's just one more son left. He's young, and Judah's going, uh, because back then, uh, a man had a, a lineage, and even if he died, his brother would sleep with the wife so his lineage could continue. I know that sounds so strange, but so he knew that the youngest one, the right thing for him to do was also to let him sleep with Tamar so that they could have a lineage for that oldest son. And what happened was the son grew up and Judah's like, I don't know, if I let him sleep with Tamar, he might die too, right? <laughs> so he's holding back and she knows it and she sees something is wrong here. There's an injustice here. And as it happens, Judah's wife dies. So that's when Tamar dresses. She covers herself in a veil and appears to be a prostitute. He sleeps with her and she keeps his staff and his signet. So when she gets pregnant and they're gonna kill her, she says, I have the staff and the signet of the father and she brings it out. And you know what Judah says? She is more righteous than I am. She is, he knew. He had messed up. He didn't have that faith. And so she became the mother of the lineage of the Messiah. What's the lesson for us in this? It's not dress up like a prostitute when you pray. Okay. <laughs> Here's what I, what I got. <laughs> Listen, if you know God is with you, yes. be gutsy. Do what you need to do. Now, that doesn't mean break the law or do something scandalous. But I think God saw her and said, oh, she's gutsy. I'm with her. And she was the solution to a problem in Judah's calling. His destiny was getting derailed, and she was the answer. Unless it's an unrighteous law, right? Then break it. Right? The Old Testament has wonderful stories for us, women that God has painted pictures of our identity and what he created us to be. But we're gonna go over, you know, the New Testament tells us that there's neither male nor female, no Jew, no Greek, but we are all one in Christ. And there are pictures in the New Testament, right, of what God created a woman, wonderful woman, who represent and carry well their identity as problem solvers, as help me. So let's go ahead and flip to the New Testament and let's look at some of these examples here. I think for this one, will you start us off, Dr. Vanessa? So for the New Testament woman, I chose Mary Magdalene. Okay, if you know her story, she was 
tormented by seven demons. Can you, and this was a wealthy woman who you can imagine she's getting, at their whim, getting battered and bruised and loss of her dignity in front of people as these demons control her. And then Jesus heals her. And from that point on, she's a new creature in Christ. I chose her because so many times we allow ourselves to be limited because of our past. We, are, we also are new creatures in Christ. And we, Satan constantly comes to attack us in our mind and tell us we're not worthy. When Jesus says that he's forgiven us and our sins are forgotten as far as the east is for the west, and we allow our lives to just be stagnant right there instead of moving on to do what he's called us to do. Amen? Amen. I talked about fertilization starting in the womb. When that sperm and egg met, that's when God already, even before they meet, God already, Jeremiah says, he, before you were even, your parents even had a notion that you were going to be born, he already had a plan and purpose for your lives and my life. Amen? And I chose her because I, I love the way she put her past behind her. And you can imagine as she goes to be a disciple with the disciples, okay, she goes along with the ministry of Jesus and she's basically an apostle to the apostles, you know, and she used her money to help fund his ministry. You can imagine what the people thought of her. She's a hoe. If he's God, shouldn't he know this? You know, she could have let them get in her head. How many times do we let, as we're doing the work of the Lord, and we let somebody get in our head and say, we're not worthy. Amen? But she was a faithful follower to Jesus. And to, for whom much has been forgiven, she gave much. And I know myself, I am so grateful for God saving my soul, cleansing me, and making me whole. And every time the enemy comes and tries to tell you, that you're not righteous, that you're not worthy, you got to turn it around with the word of God and say, I am the righteousness of God. I'm not what you say I am. I'm what God says I am. And you stand on the word and you stand in the truth. You know who you are in Christ. So when the devil comes to attack you, you can make your stand. Amen? And, you know, she was, she saw, she was in Jesus' ministry. She saw Jesus crucified. She watched them take him to the tomb, and she was there when he was resurrected. She was crying, and she didn't even know she was so hurt that he was dead, she didn't even realize she's talking to him. Amen? And when she went to tell the men what she had seen, that Jesus is risen from the dead, they didn't even believe her. And a lot of times, people don't believe we're changed. They don't believe that we have anything good to say. Because even though women's rights have changed things, a woman is not... Uh, valued the same way but you let them know that you're not just a woman you're a woman of God yeah. and when God tells you something it doesn't matter if every demon in hell tries to tell you it's not true you stand on the truth just like she did and Jesus truly had written and she risen and she was telling them the truth amen there, there's no past no past no history, nothing that you've been through, nothing that you've done, that the blood of Jesus does not restore you back to your original right. and rightful position. Anything else is a lie from the pit of hell. And she's a wonderful example of that. Pastor Michelle. Okay, I chose Lydia. In Acts, we're introduced to Lydia. This is at a time when Paul and Silas were planting churches and ministering the gospel, and they have an encounter with Lydia. Lydia was known as being as this, like, a woman of prestige. She was, she was a business owner. She was an entrepreneur. I guess you would call her, like, a present-day, like, boss babe, right? She appeared to have it all together. She came from wealth. Uh, but there was something that she was missing, and she was seeking, right? So you find her at a prayer meeting. Well, we find her at a prayer meeting in Acts where Paul is ministering to her, and then she, the Lord opens her heart, and he ministers to her. In that day, she is baptized. And it goes on to say that her family was baptized as well. And that, for me, just really touched my heart because in a worldly perspective, you can look at her and think, oh, yeah, man, she had it all together. But she knew that she was missing something, and so she was pursuing God. And because she was surrendering her life, the Lord was able to minister to her. And because of that, generations were changed. 
her family was able to receive Christ and to follow Christ. And then it talks about that she just, she used all her gifts and her talents to now further the gospel. And she was able to actually like start a church in her home, right? And then this affected generations to come. So not only did her family receive Christ and those of generations, but she started to make an impact by using her gifts and her talents and everything that God had given her because she had surrendered. And so I just, I love that because now present day age, we can get so caught up in the material things. We could get so caught up in, I have a career and I have the right car and you know, this is the way I look. And we, and we sometimes can miss the eternal perspective. And, and she knew she was missing that. And so I just love that she pursued that. And so I just wanna encourage you guys, you know, don't get caught up. It's really easy to, to look and compare and to say, I don't have this or I don't have that. But really guys, none of that stuff, we can't take it with us, right? Right? It's about our relationship with Christ. It's about the eternal perspective. It's about making an impact here on earth and reaching people. So that's why I chose Lydia. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. So her surrender took the temporal success that she had and turned it into eternal success. Amen. Right? That surrender to Christ allowed her to begin generational change on herself, her family, and her community through the church that she had. Right? It begins right there. We surrender, right? And then we step into real identity. We step into real purpose. We step into what God has created us to be. Just absolutely incredible. Pastor Tracy. Sorry, I'm just enjoying listening so much. I forgot. Oh, yeah. I got to share. <laughs> um, so I chose the woman with the issue of blood, like Tamar. She's breaking the rules, right? But she knows that God is with her. She knows that God is with her. And I don't think it's, hey, ladies, let's break the rules. But when we know God is with us, we're going to go outside the box. We're going to be bold. Maybe our relatives are saying, oh, no, don't do it. You can't do that. Your neighbors are saying it. Society is saying it. And I think the issue here is, is for those of you who don't know the story, she had a, like a menstrual flow that wasn't stopping for years and years and years and had been abused by physicians. And she knew if she could just touch Jesus, just touch his robe, she would be healed. So she pushes through the crowd. The law in those days was she was not allowed to touch anyone and had to announce that she was unclean, like, unclean, unclean, stay away. Well, she put that aside and said, I have to touch him. So she secretly touched him and secretly got healed. Well, what did Jesus do? He brought it right out to the light. And, you know, her secret didn't stay a secret. So there's a lesson there, too. I don't know. But anyway, but he praised her. And she was counted as righteous. And these are our heroes. Let's be bold. Amen? Be bold. Pastor Sue, will you wrap up this portion for us? How about a mic? How about a mic? <laughs> um, I just wanted to bring in a perspective that um, one of the greatest rights and privileges that we have as women of God is that we have throne rights. And in Christ, we've learned we're neither male nor female. And so many times we yield to insecurities, we yield to fears, we listen to the lies of the enemy that we're less than or we can't do this or we can't do that. But you know, Paul said in 2 Corinthians 12, 10, when I am weak, in my own self and ability, then I am strong in his strength and ability. And if we can't do anything else, and really this should be the first thing we do, we have throne rights. Yeah. Hebrews 4.16 says, let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So I've always been one of those, you know, God, if you don't help me, I'm in big trouble. We need to come to his throne with that kind of desperation. It's okay to feel insecure and weak, but don't stay there. Don't wallow in that. Realize that just like the great apostle Paul did and come to his throne and realize that before his throne, he says, he invites us to come boldly to obtain the mercy and the help that we need. So if he's called us to be at Circonegdos, if we're to have the strength that we need for our family, we have to get it from the throne. We have to get it from our time with God. 
And so I invite you to come boldly before his throne of grace to receive all that you need from his presence, from his wisdom, from his word, and to be the woman that you need to be in this hour. Amen. Amen. All of these women had to reach down and grab a hold of what God created them to be. They had to have the courage to stand up in the face of difficulty, in the problem situation. And I pray that because of this discussion, because of what we shared here, that you would realize that every one of these women, what they have, you have. You have. God has given it to you. He has deposited in you the ability to be that help me, to be that problem solver, to stand and do and fulfill the purpose for which you were created.